There are so many mysteries in life. William Hazlitt, philosopher, painter, and to the deep sorrow of his clergyman father, not a member of the clergy, once reminded us that instead of taking as a motto, I will lead you into all knowledge, we should rather say, I will show you a mystery. And this is pretty much the advice I give to my Zen students when they're frustrated with their latest koan. One can almost hear Handel's setting of, behold, I tell you a mystery. And though I'd never claim that my mysteries are anywhere nearly so profound, here are some that might be. Quantum entanglement, spooky action, at a distance. That old song lyric from the Fire Sign Theater, which I'm sure some of us might remember, how can you be in two places at once if you're not anywhere at all? So many mysteries. And closer to home, or at least closer to what I can wrap my head around, the question of just why do we care about, just why would we help our fellow man? that creature over there, that creature seemingly distinct from us. Speaking of spooky action at a distance, Christians and not just Christians have a view towards eternal life, a reward in heaven and eternity in hell, a kind of quid pro quo to ensure that you act properly. And if not with compassion, then at least with a simacrola of compassion. Although how a discreet act in the present can have an eternal consequence and still be called just is absolutely beyond me. Henry Kissinger, who must be a century right now, has a great deal to answer for, but forever, forever seems a little bit too much. But what of us? What, if anything, compels me, for example, to do good? And what, if anything, is the good? And just so we can be clear, we Buddhists, at least those of us I stand for, do have, if you accept the notion of rebirth in a more literal sense than I'm willing to do, we do have a notion of hell, although you can frankly, in essence, earn your way out into the next life. And the being in charge of hell, he's there just to make sure that you do that. I was talking with a fellow follower of the way the other day concerning moral compulsion and Buddhism. He couldn't see it in Christianity, but he could see it rather in, in Christianity, but he couldn't see it in Buddhism and asked the reasonable question of, why do we act as we do? It set me off on a long and twisted road. Let me take you along for the ride, beginning by my kitchen range. I spent a fair amount of time in the kitchen and I found myself stirring pots of thick molten concoctions, spitting and fuming on the range. And there is nothing quite like having a pot of polenta burp up a glob of molten cornmeal onto the side of your hand as you tend to it. And should, or rather, when that does happen, without a thought, without a moment's notice, you turn to the sink, you stick your hand under, under the faucet and turn on a tap of cold and soothing water. No compulsion, no sense of, I should do this. No sense of, no thought, no, no time for thought. You just, you just turn and do it. And that hand, that hand, this hand, is ever so far from the rest of you. It's all the way down at the end of my arm. It's a part, it's a part in pain, a part that needs care. There's no debate that takes place though, no weighing of consequences. I don't stop to say to myself, I watch out for my overall health. I pay for health insurance. 
I shouldn't have to make extra allowances for that burned hand. I don't wonder if I care for this hand now, will it take advantage of my largesse and go and spend it on drugs or, or <laughs> alcohol? No, my hand is injured. I cradle it and I care for it. So here, let me make another abrupt turn on one of those 99 twists in the road. About 60 years ago, I was in a fifth grade class at the Millard Fillmore Elementary School in Hamilton, Ohio, with a teacher, Mrs. Dayton, who would gather us together every once in a while, stand us all up against the blackboard and lead us in song. I had always been, as my mother would have told you, a glum child, and festive singing was not something in my nature. I only remember one of the songs, a piece called No Man is an Island. There are versions of it sung by Joan Baez and other folkies. It's clearly influenced by John Donne, in particular Donne's 17th Meditation, a part of the devotions on emergent occasions, which we heard just a short while ago. Dunn puts his finger on the key to my mystery. We care for one another because we are one another. Not islands, but a part of the main. You, I, Donald Trump, Jimmy Carter, we are all one. We are all, and, and at the same time, we are all separate. There is no essence. We're defined by our relationships. All the things, all things actually, are defined by their relationships. This pulpit, this lectern is simply random pieces of wood until one of us, Hutch, stands, stands aside and puts it together. And then until one of us, stands behind it and makes it a pulpit. I'm the end result of my relations with my mother, my father, my brothers, my wife, my son and daughter, with each of you who are sitting here in front of me. We are all, all of us, we are all one another. And just as I can no more sever my own burned hand without diminishing myself, I can no more sever those relations with all of my history, with all of my presence, with all of us. We are all a part of that main. What haunts me today about those elementary school choral interludes from 60 years ago is that looking across the state line to Ohio now, I can't imagine in today's world a fifth grade Midwestern teacher leading her class in a song so clearly influenced, if not by socialism, then at least by that near kin to socialism, FDR's New Deal. The song itself has lyrics that, if not with the ancient grace of John Donne, still with a firm and poignant fellow feeling go, no man is an island, no man stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me, each man's grief is my own. We need one another, so I will defend each man as my brother, each man as my friend. A fitting introduction to the idea of non-duality for a group of school kids. But this is where I find myself thinking back to that moral compulsion that my friends searched for and could not find in Buddhism. There is no need to search. There is no need for compulsion. Deep into the boundless, deep into emptiness, deep in our own hearts, we are one. You and I, you and the chair that supports you, the birds at the bird feeder in the backyard, you and I, my backyard and myself, we are all that continent. We are all a part of that man each a part of and interpenetrating with, as connected to one another as my hand, that injured hand, that injured hand that I did say I would come back to. 
And just as when I turn without thought, without calculation, without conscious intent, to place that burned hand into a stream of soothing cold water, so without thought, without calculation, without conscious intent, do we reach out to one another. No compulsion, no unearthly demands, no promises of reward, pure instinct. Like the Bodhisattva of compassion, Guan Yin, in case number 89, in that great work of medieval Chinese literature, the Blue Cliff Record, where we find the monk Yunyan asked Dao Wu, how does the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion, use all those hands and eyes? We've all seen statues of of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, you know, a thousand arms. My, my sense is that basically in ancient China, in ancient India, people didn't have films. They just present, you know, they, they presented a thousand arms as a thousand arms moving constantly. So, Dawu answered, it's like someone in the middle of the night reaching behind her head for a pillow. What can be more instinctual than that? I can't tell you the number of times last night that I reached behind my head for a pillow without a thought, just to reach out. I understand, returned Yun, Yun Yan. How do you understand, asked Dao Wu. All over the body are hands and eyes. It's very well expressed, replied Dao Wu, but it's only eight tenths of the answer. How would you say it, elder brother? Throughout the body are hands and eyes. I'll let that stay as a mystery, but, but just remember the instinct involved. Now, of course, life doesn't work like that, you say. A stranger approaches, puts out his hand, and we turn away. Our minds, no, let me be honest, my mind immediately goes into the mode of justifying my lack of help. He'll misuse the money, he'll buy drugs, booze, he doesn't look at all that destitute. I support homeless shelters. I give to the United Way. Why doesn't he go there? As my great 19th century literary ancestor Ebenezer Scrooge once said, are there no prisons? no workhouses. And that homeless kitten, that kitten probably has fleas. And the dog, the dog looks to have rabies. We, we have, I have all of these boxes ready-made to put those I encounter into, locked away in safety. The judging mind steps forth to protect me and my wallet. One moment, in just one moment, an instant, and the thoughts rise up, the armor is put in, pla in, is put in place, the hand which was open just a moment ago closes like a fist. But there, in that split second before the hand closes, just there while the hand is still open, when we still are ourselves still open, still vulnerable, still a part of the boundless, in that moment, before the knowing mind shuts the door, before it paints the other with its conceptual paintbrush, before it knows all the boxes to employ, in that split second, reach back to that pillow in the middle of the night. We have, before the door closes, before the open hand becomes a fist, we have that chance, that call, to be the bodhisattva of compassion like plunging a burned hand in soothing ice-cold water without a thought, without compulsion. That moment, hold on to that moment with the lightest of touches and listen closely. For you were involved in mankind. Listen, do you hear it? That bell, it tolls for thee. Thank you. <laughs>